Yeah. Um, hello, Emily. Can you hear me? Hey, Simeon. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, yes, uh, yes. My name is Simeon Hahn, and I uh, work for uh, NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And I'd just like to uh, provide um, some brief help, uh, help welcome welcome everybody, and provide some brief a uh, brief background on the Urban Water Federal Partnership and this location. Um, so NOAA, um, as I mentioned, stands for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, but the products and services are not limited to the ocean and atmosphere, as, as the name may suggest. I, I work in the National Ocean Service in the Office of Response and Restoration, and my boss's boss's boss is here to, on the agenda today to speak, so uh, we're, we're glad to have him. NOAA also includes other offices like the National Weather Service, the National Marine Fishery Service. Uh, many people know the Marine and Aviation Services for boaters and, and, and pilots. Uh, there's also the satellite and, and research offices. So, you know, we serve the whole country, uh, including interior and coastal cities. And uh, the tidal Delaware River is in a coastal area. And I always remind people, Philadelphia is a coastal city. Wilmington, Chester, and Camden are coastal cities with urban waterways. And why do I mention that? Um, in 2011, the EPA, under uh, then administrator Lisa Jackson, who many of us know uh, from New Jersey, uh, DEP, uh, led an effort to help urban communities, particularly disadvantaged communities, uh, reconnect with and revitalize their, their waterways. So EPA partnered with several uh, federal agencies, including NOAA, um, in close coordination with the White House Domestic Policy Council to form this urban water federal partnership. Um, now, what's different about this one, in, and I think was that it, it's linking water um, restoration efforts to other community priorities, such as unemployment, business development, education, recreational, and social opportunities, um, including environmental justice. So I was involved with the Anacostia River in Washington, D.C. Um, before this urban water um, program took off, um, and we had a group called the Anacostia Watershed Toxics Alliance. Again, a, a group working in partnership. Uh, but I think that experience of working in Washington, also in the Elizabeth River, uh, the management from NOAA designated me as a point of contact for urban waters in the Anacostia location. And I was also on the National Steering Group when the Ur Urban Wash Waters Federal Partnership uh, efforts were kicking off. And in 2012, uh, NOAA, I worked with Michael Raines from the F United States Forest Service to nominate the Delaware River into the second round of urban water federal locations. Um, there was also a proposal from the Brandywine River in Delaware, and I uh, got to meet good friend and partner Bobby Britton as part of that. That, that um, Brandywine River proposal uh, was endorsed by now President Biden. Um, but anyway, NOAA political leadership at that time uh, agreed for NOAA to be a co-lead agency for the Delaware River. Uh, it's a major port area. Uh, there's a lot of people and infrastructure vulnerable to climate change. And there's some really unique natural resources like the endangered Atlantic sturgeon and uh, migratory fish and freshwater tidal habitats. So um, we were excited to uh, bring this partnership or help bring this partnership forward. Um, since that time, the leadership at, at NOAA um, has changed, the political leadership especially, and it's been a, uh, kind of a challenge keeping that political leadership um, identified, Or, but, you know, we've kept pushing through. But when we formed this, we um, first in the Urban Water Federal Partnership formed uh, some communities of practices, and this is the Brownfield Community Practice. Uh, informed, and I co-chair it with Frank McLaughlin from New Jersey DEP. Frank uh, and New Jersey DEP are tremendous uh, leaders in, in our partnership and in environmental justice. We'll be hearing from them. Uh, the EPA has also been a tremendous federal partner in our Brownfield community of practice, uh, as well as other federal agencies, uh, including the DOI. But the, our community of practice is focused on cities. It's kind of place-based, Camden, Wilmington, Chester, Philadelphia. And um, well, we've taken a different view of brownfields uh, than the traditional one, you know, incorporating the urban water principles of looking at economics, resilience, social justice, environmental justice. Um, 
At our last in-person meeting in, in, in the Delaware DENREC offices, at the Delaware Environmental Offices, um, attendees specifically requested more information on environmental justice, as well as housing and transportation programs. So um, we will also be focusing on some outreach and communication efforts, and I'm happy to have my daughter involved in some of those, and we'll, we'll be hearing from that. So there, there, there were also maybe a fourth seminar in this series covering some different topics. We really want to keep the uh, discussion uh, in, in community outreach going. You know, we miss our intimate meetings. Um, we rotated around the city, uh, the, the cities, and we'd have eight hour meetings and they were really good. We'd see sites, but in this virtual world, we're able to expand to broader locations. And, uh, you know, so there's pluses and minuses of each, uh, but uh, we want to stay in contact and we're doing that virtually, but look forward to meeting in per person. Um, you know, the in-person, the, the collaboration across the cities from the agencies and such has been priceless, you know, the learning experiences, and, and we'll hear about that throughout the time. I just wanted to end before I turn it over to uh, Frank, um, that this is kind of a, a renewed time, uh, in my opinion, for um, the Urban Water Federal Partnership. I mean, we have a new ambassador and the partnership uh, for the Delaware uh, Estuary, um, providing that ambassador, Emily, um, and she is fantastic. And uh, the partner Del partnership for Delaware Estuary has a wide group. Uh, so that's great. There's also some other efforts in the Delaware we're trying to merge with. You know, there's been a lot of efforts uh, maybe in the headwater and the scenic river areas in the bay. And so we, we, there's a coalition now uh, for the Delaware. So, you know, we're, we're, we're bringing the urban focus in. Um, but uh, Emily, you know, we, we are also, and Emily um, will we'll speak to this maybe a little bit, uh, you know, we're in a, a reorganization perhaps type mode and a rework plan development. So we're always like really want to be open and hear from the public who really drives this process in the location specifically of what their needs are and how the federal agencies can provide the assistance. Um, so before I turn back to Emily, I did want to turn it over to Frank from New Jersey DEP. Frank is a, is a very real person who I admire greatly, a real problem solver and a true a warrior for environmental justice. He, he stays in good trouble, as uh, the late, great John Lewis would say. Um, as, just as an example, Frank and I conducted a session at the National Brownfield Conference uh, in Los Angeles last year talking about climate resilience in brownfields. And, um, you know, that was something that we think is yeah, very intuitive, but it was viewed as pioneering there. And so, you know, uh, the, the brownfield program is different now in our region, especially in our urban water federal partnership, thanks to people like Frank and uh, our, our colleagues with the EPA. So with that, Frank, uh, take it away. Thank you, Simeon, for those kind words. And, and thank you, everybody, for uh, joining this uh, webinar on Brownfields uh, and Environmental Justice Community Practice. My name is Frank McLaughlin, and uh, I have been uh, very fortunate to have a, a, a long career at the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection and have helped evolve the agency to be more responsive to the urban environment and the people that are living there. That's been my mission. Um, as a public servant, and, uh, uh, and, and when you meet partners like Simeon Han from NOAA, who has also been a champion for voiceless communities and worked for a large uh, bureaucracy like I do to try to steer a large ship to bring the resources that underserved communities have deserved since the late 80s when I started at New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection and thinking, you know, Thinking of spring, the nice weather we've been having in the last week and um, Earth Day coming up in, in April, uh, my, my friends at the Environmental Protection Agency and, uh, and NJDP started Earth Day 1970. So we've been at it 51 years. And cities like Camden, parts of Philadelphia, certainly Chester and Wilmington too, like Camden, they have been underserved by our agencies. and. Uh, Doing webinars like this and working with uh, great local and regional partners like the Partners for Delaware Estuary 
This is how we're going to change the paradigm, bringing like-minded people, traditional and non-traditional partners together so many hands can make the work that, that these communities need and deserve. Uh, Brownfield has always been a great place to start a conversation locally because everybody can agree upon these blighted sites that are preventing these communities from becoming the communities they want to be. And specific in Camden, these blighted brownfield sites were an impediment just to get people to the beautiful Delaware River. And um, that's been a, a goal of mine. And uh, later you're going to hear from um, New Jersey DEP's Deputy Commissioner for Environmental Justice and Equity and uh, Olivia Glenn. And not only is she a leader in this, she lived this growing up in Camden. So her personal story and now her leadership at DEP is um, really going to help us move the ball forward in these, again, these community that have long deserved our attention and, um, and having broad partnerships, not only bring in the environmental experts, but also the social, the economic and the public health experts to, to, to this cause is really important. So I re we really appreciate all of you joining this webinar and helping us row in the, the row in our beautiful Delaware River and our urban uh, tidal freshwater estuary that we have here so we can make it the place that we all dream upon, dream about for everybody, not just um, the wealthier communities within our, within our, uh, our basin, but also but all communities within our basin. So thank you so much for, for coming today and hopefully in the next two and maybe three seminars. And I'm going to pass it over to Emily uh, Baumbach, but I wanted to mention one thing about Partnership for Delaware Estuary, right? We, we met them in Camden close to 10 years ago at the Harrison Avenue Landfill, which is a story we'll talk about in one of these webinars. And they have now designed at another site, Phoenix Park, next to the Camden County Municipal Utility Authority, and in front of the third largest wastewater treatment plant in, in New Jersey, a living shoreline and building resiliency efforts. So, so we're, we got to combat not only yesterday's injustices, but our future injustices coming because it's the same communities with the environmental stressors that are going to be most challenged by climate change and sea level rise. And uh, working for the partnership at Delaware Estuary, who've done everything from taking Camden residents out on boats and teaching them how to identify freshwater mussels to now building our resilient communities site by site in Camden. So I just wanted to thank Emily personally and PDE as well. Uh, so thank you, thank you PDE, and thank you Emily. And again, thank you Simeon for also bringing attention to the communities uh, that deserve agency attention. All right, great. Thanks so much Simeon and Frank. And again, yes, thank you to all the attendees that really you know, tuned in for this webinar today. We do have I think a little over 100 people tuned in right now, um, so that's fantastic. Um, again, I'm Emily Bombeck, and I'm the Estuary Program Coordinator with the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary. Um, and for anyone that might not be in, um, aware of PDE, so we're an environmental nonprofit organization that leads science-based and uh, collaborative efforts to improve the tidal Delaware River and Bay, which spans uh, Delaware, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. Um, and so I also serve as the ambassador for the Urban Waters Federal Partnership at the Delaware River location. And um, so the goals of the Urban Waters Federal Partnership are to, you know, restore and reconnect urban communities, particularly those that are overburdened or economically distressed uh, to waterways by improving coordination among federal agencies uh, to their communities. And so the Delaware River Urban Waters location encompasses the four major urban areas of Philadelphia and Chester, Pennsylvania, Wilmington, Delaware, and Camden, New Jersey. And as Simeon had you know, already mentioned, our location is really happy to be kind of revamping and prioritizing some future efforts. Um, up on the slide here, we have just our locations kind of previous challenge areas. And many of these will continue to be priority items in our updated work plan, um, including environmental justice. And our location um, is in the process of you know, updating a work plan and we really welcome feedback from all of you on our future priorities. So we're actually gonna go ahead and 
uh, link our online work plan kind of feedback form into the chat right now. Um, and we've been meeting with our you know, federal leads as well as our key partners that are involved in this partnership on a pretty regular basis just to keep you know, conversations going about you know, how this urban waters location can really add value to this watershed. Um, and we're looking forward to incorporating feedback from folks who live and work in these areas um, into this work plan. And again, environmental justice, it's a priority for this urban waters location and our core partners involved. And you know, we're very excited to have a fantastic group of speakers this afternoon to really share their work and expertise on environmental justice to kick us off for this first webinar in this three-part series. And with that, you know, I'm very happy to introduce our first speaker today to help us kind of you know, set the stage for a conversation about environmental justice. Um, so Jeffrey Richardson is with the Delaware Community Benefits Agreement Coalition and has uh, decades of experience in the environmental justice space and also teaches at the University of Delaware. So with that, um, Jeffrey, I'm going to pass it over to you and we look forward to hearing your, your opening talk for us. Thank you very much, Emily, and I um, want to thank Simeon and Frank and Simeon, you know, just connecting us with this whole effort. And thank you for all of the great work that you're doing. And so I'm really excited to be here and just to spend a couple of moments. And so my charge, I guess, is to talk a little bit about environmental justice. So I'm going to do a sheer screen and then come out of that after I'm completed with it. So again, my charge is to talk about environmental justice. And again, I'm thankful and we appreciate this opportunity. I'm speaking on behalf of the Delaware Community Benefits Agreement Coalition. And we want to thank again the partnership for the Delaware Estuary and the Urban Water Federal Partnership and all of the parties involved. So what is environmental justice? I'll take a few moments to speak about this. And um, what I wanted to do is the first to lay out what environmental justice is, what environmental justice is. Let's see here. So, and, but before I do that, I wanna speak a little bit about who we are as the Delaware Community Benefits Agreement Coalition. So the Delaware Community Benefits Agreement Coalition, it's comprised of many organizations. Um, it's a coalition, uh, groups that are community-based organizations, faith-based organizations, people from the business community, environmental groups, and others. And the coalition was formed principally in order to develop the terms and to oversee the implementation and compliance for a community benefits agreement framework that prioritizes community economic and environmental health and sustainability. So that's who we are at the Delaware Community Benefits Agreement Coalition. We have one planet, one environment, and environmental justice looks at the environment through this lens. The environment is where we live, where we work, where we play, where we worship, and where we go to school. Where we live, where we work, play, worship, and go to school, as well as the physical and natural world. Um, typically, traditional environmentalism looks at the physical and natural world as the core and maybe doesn't talk about those other areas. So environmental justice takes this approach, a holistic approach of looking at where we live, work, play, worship, go to school, as well as the physical and natural world, because many of the communities, environmental justice communities, as has been spoken of in the introduction, people of color, low-income communities live in urban areas or in rural areas next to facilities that may not be considered, say, the mountains or the waters, but they are part of the environment. So what is environmental justice? A, a definition. <clears throat> so the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policy. It's the fair treatment, and that means that no group of people, including racial, ethnic, or socioeconomic groups, should bear a disproportionate share of the negative environmental consequences resulting from industrial, municipal, commercial operations, or the execution of federal, state, local, and travel programs and policies. And this is key because in the history of this country and currently, the federal government itself has unfortunately been involved in perpetuating 
some of the challenges that we face. Some things have happened that have been good, but the government has also played a role in perpetuating these. So we want to get to address those issues as well. So simply put, environmental justice demands that everyone, not just the people who can vote with their feet and move away from threats or individuals who can afford lawyers or experts and lobbyists to fight on their behalf, but everyone is entitled to equal protection and equal enforcement of our environmental, health, housing, land use, transportation, energy, and civil rights laws and regulations. So a definition of environmental justice. So environmental justice is not just redistributing environmental harms. Environmental justice takes the approach that we want to actually abolish environmental harms. And, and for me, looking at this, we want to transition away from the current models. And there's a whole focus and movements working on something called a just transition. So we want to transition away from models and values that represent a near worship of economic growth and the free market over human life and the sustainability of life as an extension of a healed and cared for environment. So it requires a shift of values and possibly the way we structure our lives here and, and our economy. So we're talking about deep changes. Environmental justice is based upon the requirement that we speak for ourselves, that is people of color, low-income people, et cetera, people from communities that are most impacted by environmental hazards speak for themselves, that there won't be patronizing or paternalistic or racist practices where people think they can speak for, that should not happen. And that the people who are most impacted by environmental hazards must have power in shaping the solutions and dealing with the negotiations for change. So speaking for themselves and having power. Part of the discussion about environmental justice is related to the history of America. If we look at the native population here, indigenous people, Native Americans whose land was taken from them, this is at the beginning. So we have a, a, a cataclysmic kind of impact at the beginning of the start of this country where land was taken from indigenous people. And we can talk about environmental justice occurring at that moment where we did not address environmental justice, but we had environmental injustice, even at the beginning of the country. And we look at the history of African people, people of African descent in this country. A statement made by Beverly Wright, I think captures this as she talks about the history of the country and slavery and environmental harm, environmental racism involved in that. She states that the disenfranchisement of an entire race of people was the law in the Southern states, but it was practiced throughout the country and its forms included discrimination in housing, education, and public transportation, as well as the availability of recreational facilities and restaurant service. Environmental racism is merely one vestige of the overall pattern and practice of racism in the United States. So again, environmental racism is, the, is merely one vestige of the overall pattern and practice of racism in the United States. So a system that is racist produces racist outcomes in the practice of and the application of its laws, policies, and procedures. So how does this play itself out? I and mean, if we look at racism and the environment and how that's connected to health, I'll just use two examples. I could talk about the Asian Pacific Islander community, the Spanish speaking communities in this country and others. But looking at the Native American population here, we had the government participating in genocidal practices against indigenous people, taking their land, extracting mineral wealth, right? So economics has always been a part of this and the environmental justice analysis. Mineral wealth, fishing, timber, attacks on their culture, attacks on their sovereignty, moving forcibly people to reservations. And this resulted in impoverishment and devastating environmental health consequences. For the African-American community, we just talked about this history of slavery, which is part of where this begins for us in America and forcing African people to work lands, black people in this country, this wealth that was gleaned from slavery undergirds the industrial growth of our country. So discriminatory lending practices later on, like redlining specifically, spatial isolation, 
limited access to fresh food options, job discrimination, political disenfranchisement, and the disproportionate siting of polluting facilities in or near these communities. And it results again in devastating environmental and health consequences. And we can see now during this period of time dealing with COVID that these communities, black, brown communities, poor communities also have lack of access to healthcare, hospitals, et cetera. And this all results in this cumulative damage that we see exacerbated with this pandemic that we're experiencing now. I also wanna just finish up a little bit talking about a whole history of the environmental justice movement. That's a whole nother presentation. But one point I wanna pull out here is the first National People of Color Environmental Summit. People coming from various parts of the world and they had another summit about 10 years later that brought even more people from around the world to develop what we now know as the environmental justice movement. And one of the results of that was the development of 17 principles of environmental justice, 17 principles of environmental justice. So you can look that up and really important to read, gives you a sense of the values and focus. And I'll just read a couple. Environmental justice affirms the sacredness of Mother Earth, ecological unity, and the interdependence of all species and the right to be free from ecological destruction. Environmental justice mandates the right to ethical, balanced, and responsible uses of land and renewable resources in the interest of a sustainable planet for humans and other living things. It calls for universal protection from nuclear testing, extraction, production, and disposal of toxic hazardous waste and poisons and nuclear testing that threaten the fundamental right to clean air, land, water, and food. It affirms the fundamental right to political, economic, cultural, and environmental self-determination of all peoples. And it demands the cessation of the production of all toxins, hazardous waste, and radioactive materials, and that all past and current producers be held strictly accountable to the people for detoxification and the containment at the point of production, and it opposes the destructive operations of multinational corporations. So there are others, I won't read all those, but there's 17 principles of environmental justice. Again, environmental justice, the fair treatment of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws regulations and policies. We have one planet, one world, one opportunity to do what is important for all of us as human beings to come together to protect the future of our planet and respect the humanity of all people. So environmental justice, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Jeffrey. That was great. Definitely interested in reading more about those environmental justice principles. So I'm going to have to look that up myself. Go ahead and get the slide deck going again. All right. So moving into our next session to kind of kick us off um, for the federal perspectives on environmental justice, our next speaker is. Scott Lundgren, with, he's the director of NOAA's Office of Response and Restoration. Um, so take it away, Scott. We're happy to have you here. All right, and I'm happy to be here as well. Good afternoon, everyone. And thanks so much to the organizing group, Emily Bombach, PDE, Simeon Hahn, Frank McLaughlin for arranging this great webinar series. And thank you as well to my fellow panelists and to all of you attending today for your interest and participation. Please to offer some remarks on environmental justice and support to underserved communities from my perspective as the director of the Office of Response and Restoration and as a NOAA senior executive. And I look forward to hearing the perspectives of my colleagues on this important topic. As the director of NOAA's Office of Response and Restoration, known as ORNR, I want to put my comment on environmental justice first in the context of my office's mission set. In our actions and then speak to the wider NOAA and administration's focus on equity. ORNR is a center of expertise within NOAA's National Ocean Service in preparing for, evaluating, and responding to threats to coastal environments, including from oil and chemical spills, 
hazardous weight size releases, marine debris, and natural disasters. We work to fulfill our mission of protecting and restoring NOAA trust resources by preparing the National Ocean Service and our partners for disasters, whether the natural in origin or from human actions, providing scientific and technical support to prepare for and respond to oil and chemical spills, including chronic releases, assessing and restoring injured natural resources and lost public use from damage from such spills and waste sites, which often are chronic in nature and very much like a disaster. And then finally, marine debris, uh, investigating and preventing the harmful um, impacts of marine debris. And across this portfolio, we work with communities to address the critical local and regional coastal challenges. Speaking more to the natural resource injury and restoration part of the portfolio, NOAA serves as a steward or trustee for coastal and marine resources by protecting and restoring these resources. NOAA trust resources are plentiful, plentiful in the urban water federal part of Delaware watershed location. It's a coastal area, it serves millions of people and has unique resources, including anadromous fish, freshwater tidal wetlands, sturgeon, and coastal areas are not strictly limited, as Simeon mentioned, to bays and oceans. They include many urban areas that we can better serve. We have staff across the ORNR programs around the country to help us better connect with our partners in the work that we do. In this region, Simeon is our local regional resource coordinator and environmental scientist and trustee, working out of Philadelphia and covering the Mid-Atlantic and select New York and New Jersey cases on the natural resource injury and restoration part of my office's portfolio. Through NOAA's engagement, in the Urban, urban Waters Federal Partnership, Simeon has promoted the design and implementation of urban living shoreline restoration projects. He's been recognized and has given remarks in an award ceremony for across the National Ocean Service, my parent office, for his important work in this region and in environmental justice. The urban Delaware River area continues to get more local, regional, and national recognition in accomplishing urban water restoration goals. And in particular, it's a model for remediation of contaminated sites, urban habitat restoration, water quality, and climate resilience efforts. And these can be coordinated to give real benefits to the community. There are specific project examples that I'd like to highlight. No provided funding supporting a project led by the Partnership of Delaware Estuary and New Jersey DEP to implement living shoreline restoration in Camden, New Jersey at the Harrison Avenue landfill. And NOAA was an initial sponsor and provided a continuum of support towards the nationally recognized South Wilmington Wetland Restoration Project and supported a Larders Point project in Philadelphia that was a model for urban living shoreline. In other partnership work, NOAA through Simeon co-chairs the Urban Waters Federal Partnership Brownfield Community of Practice, as you heard, with Frank from New Jersey DEP. This community of practice has been highly successful in the partnership. Simeon has conducted brownfield grant application reviews for EPA Region 3 coastal brownfield sites that allow for grants that go directly to communities and nonprofits for cleanup and redevelopment, job creation, and economic development to help transform neglected and contaminated properties into community resources. Simeon has also worked to connect several local urban water restoration projects, including partnering with the city of Wilmington, through support of an EPA Brownfield grant, and as a partner with the Brandywine Shad 2020 through support of a National Fish and Wildlife grant to assist in their dam removal efforts on the Brandywine River in Wilmington and supporting the EJ community. More specifically related to our restoration of sites, over the years, NOAA has examples of supporting urban environmental restoration via natural resource damage assessment or NERDA settlements. Funds from the Presidente Rivera oil spill supported the aforementioned restoration of the Harrison Avenue landfill site in Camden, and funds from the Athos spill settlement supported the Lardner's Point project in Philadelphia. We'll continue to seek opportunities to coordinate NERDA restoration with the partnership focus area priorities. We're committed to prioritizing our work in impacted EJ communities by including the potential for injury to EJ communities as part of our site selection criteria. We're currently in the process of accepting two additional sites, Coppers in Newport, Delaware, Metro Container and Trainer, Pennsylvania's cases for which to pursue settlements. 
We're also committed to engaging local communities in our efforts to prioritize restoration as close as possible to where the injury to natural resources occurred and to better understand community support for restoration options. We have one settlement out for public comment in the Metal Bank site in Philadelphia and another one forthcoming for the DuPont Hay Road site in Edgeborn, Delaware. I'll now shift from that restoration side to the Marine Debris Program. This program is the federal government's lead for addressing marine debris and supports locally driven marine debris prevention, assessment, and removal projects that can benefit coastal habitat, waterways, and NOAA Trust resources. It's no surprise that plastic pollution is one of the most abundant types of marine debris and often disproportionately affects low-income communities. Last year, the Marine Debris Program shared its strategic plan for the next five years and its commitment to diversity, inclusion, and equity. The program committed to engaging more diverse community by including new voices in the formation of its products and through multiple actions such as funding and underserved and underrepresented communities, increasing collection of marine debris monitoring data in areas that have not been previously recorded, and translating more materials into non-English languages. We support communities across the U.S. by funding projects through competitive grants, and we're working better to better understand who past projects have benefited and how we can better serve minority, underrepresented communities and communities that are overburdened with marine debris moving forward. We're also working to expand the types of organizations that compete for funding by broadcasting these opportunities more broadly and providing new tools and resources to support new applicants. We incorporate issues of equity and diversity in our decision making, and the program has examples around the U.S. of funded grant projects working with tribes, territories, and underserved communities. In, in the Mid-Atlantic, an example is a multi-year project in Masonville Cove, an underserved, highly urbanized restoration site in Baltimore, Maryland, on the Patapsco River. Litter and debris are a huge problem in this area, affecting not only water quality, but also the quality of life in surrounding neighborhoods. An urban wildlife refuge partnership site, the project had lasting effects on the partners, and even though the funding from NOAA has ended, the partnership that was kindled by the project continues. The Marine Debris Program has also funded a multi-year project in Camden to, to remove large debris from the Camden shoreline and establish a living shoreline along Phoenix Park. The marine debris removal was key for helping to restore this living shoreline and provide access to the shore for Camden residents. Now, speaking beyond my office, the administration's agenda focuses on advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities across government. And consistent with this priority, we're expanding our focus on equitable delivery of government services and funding. This is a priority of this administration. We expect more attention and direction on this important issue as we move forward. NOAA is implementing Executive Order 13985 on advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities through the federal government, as well as racial and environmental justice elements in other executive orders that pertain to NOAA, such as those on climate. There's a working group across the six line offices, Simeon mentioned these, weather, fisheries, oceans, satellites, and so on. And they're developing a roadmap to address this executive order. The group is dedicated to advancing the culture of inclusion, not only within NOAA, but in our work across the US and its territories. NOAA is committed to deepen its commitment and engagement with vulnerable communities and to ensure that we address barriers that vulnerable communities may have when trying to access the products and services that we provide to the public. So it was my pleasure to join you here today and talk about this very important topic of equity and support for underserved communities on this Brownfields and Environmental Justice webinar. We've done important work in this area especially related to Simeon's work with the Urban Waters Federal Partnership, and we're committed to doing more to make our programs more accessible and more beneficial to underserved communities. Thank you, and I very much look forward to this conversation. Great, thank you so much, Scott. Thanks again for joining us today. So our next speaker in this session is Andrew Dinsmore. Um, Andrew's a staff member with U.S. Senator Chris Coons of Delaware. Um, so Andrew, over to you, thank you. Great, thanks Emily. Um, thanks Frank as well for that. Um, one of the things I was, was looking forward to on this is hearing from uh, more folks that know and EPA about uh, some of the really good work they do. Um, let me just first start off by saying even though it's being recorded and I work for Chris, uh, most of what I'll say is 
uh, are my thoughts. Uh, I'll talk about some of the work I've done for Chris and some of Chris's work, but um, most of these are my thoughts um, and, and some of the work I've been involved with with Chris on environmental justice. Um, and and Je Jeffrey's, Jeffrey's definition of environmental justice was, was good. Um, the way I sort of explain how I approach environmental justice is uh, just sort of just a brief anecdote. When I was I worked for a nonprofit in Kenya and Uganda for a while. Uh, we were planting trees with subsistence farmers and trying to pay them uh, a small, trying to pay them um, revenue from the carbon credits sold by the carbon the trees aggregated. Uh, and we were pitching pitching the company to uh, a, a large bank in New York who had like two percent of their funding set aside for socially responsible investing, uh, and they were trying to, to impress upon us how 2% of their funding was for socially responsible investing. And when, when it became clear we weren't gonna get a lot of money from them, my boss sort of asked, what if 2% is for socially responsible investing, what's the other 90%, 98% for? Uh, they sort of stopped and then they sort of realized, you know, it's socially irresponsible uh, investing. So it, and the way I guess I approach environmental justice is sort of, you know, if it's not environmental, I guess it's the work we're doing is in environmental justice, it, what, how would you characterize it? Uh, and I, you know, I guess the, the the other side of that is uh, you just call it environmental injustice. So that's sort of uh, I that's sort of how we sort of broadly, you know, that's how I sort of broadly cast uh, cast the net on a lot of what what I do for Chris's office. And then I do this this morning. This is rough, and don't hold me to this. But this is sort of how. Uh, in my job, I, I'm basically a fixer for Chris. I fix, uh, handle environmental issues, in energy, transportation, uh, business, and a lot of uh, appropriations funding. Um, before I do that, um, I also say we, our appropriations request form is live. Uh, I just hit put in the link. Um, uh, we're in the middle of our appropriations cycle. Uh, and so um, this is sort of vote for your favorite federal agency, or more than one federal agency. Um, uh, this is not an earmark process. The Senate isn't doing earmarks yet this year, um, uh, but this form is sort of what we use to gather feedback on uh, who, what, where, why, how to fund uh, federal agencies. Um, uh, and so this is this is how we gather that input among amongst other ways. We sort of do it lots of ways. Um, so if you have a favorite EPA program that's really niche and small, but does awesome stuff um, in uh, on the Delaware River, um, uh, and you're a constituent of ours, feel free to send this to us. Uh, um, so anyways, that's on the link. If you have questions about it, you can feel free to call me. So this is, this is how sort of, I don't know if you can see, you can see that. This is sort of how, I'll straighten it out. Uh, so environmental justice in my mind is sort of uh, really simplified sort of on an X, Y, you know, uh, what are your resources? How do you fall on sort of power dynamic? Obviously that goes into power, that goes into resources. Uh, just as a starting point, I sort of have like my dad, retired attorney, uh, who's known to like spray paint potholes that aren't getting fixed uh, and sort of force the city to fix potholes on busy roads, uh, but not totally crazy, uh, but has lots of spare time on his hands. Um, uh, this is like Microsoft sort of high power, high resources to do environmental good. And then like sort of off here is like Chief Coker or like Lorraine Fleming, for some of you who know them, like uh, and I guess the way we approach some of our work is uh, trying to get environmental justice. We sort of run into people all over the place, but there's sort of a lot of people sort of, there's like a strong little cluster, like right there uh, of people who don't think they have a lot of power, but we think they have a lot more power than they do. And so trying to get, uh, trying to either fund programs or sort of individually improve uh, their capacity, uh, their knowledge of how systems work, and sort of share uh, some of the some of the things we've learned and that we can do along the way. There's a lot I don't know, I, um, uh, but we're one of the things I've realized ten years in is uh, asking questions and sort of sharing, uh, sort of forwarding on an email. That's a really good question, but no one at the state or federal agencies listen to it yet, or they don't even know that they could ask it. Is to sort of say, well, look. I, if you don't want to, you know, I'm more than glad to ask this question for you, but you should be comfortable asking. Um, it's sort of uh, increasing people's comfortable comfortability with it um, and saying, uh, look, you've been focusing on EPA funding programs. 
to learn about water quality, but have you ever asked USGS what they're doing on the Delaware River? No. Okay. Well, uh, here's uh, you know here's a link, and here's the person that is sort of the point person on that that's tracking it. So um, uh, that's that's one of the ways we sort of view our mission is to sort of get people sort of increase their capacity, increase their comfort level with uh, understanding of how much power and if ability they actually have. But also part of I guess it'd be sort of ignorant of me not to recognize that, um, you know, I think we, we, we especially have been uh, not as conscientious about uh, some issues in some communities as we should have. And so being more diligent uh, in both a focus on it, uh, but listening to, listening to people when they point out, uh, let me back. most of the really good ideas we've ever had have been brought to us by people who say, this program doesn't do this, but it does X, Y, and Z. Here's a slate of programs that have been funded for the past five years. We can't get funded because we're in the wrong zip code, and here's where it says that in, you know, whatever language it is. Uh, and um, and sort of taking ideas like that or questions like that, and sort of going down the rabbit hole on them. And I think the first time I ever met Simeon was uh, I'd heard about Simeon for a few years, uh, and uh, people kept talking about uh, the South Wilmington Wetland Project, uh, and one of the things. You know, we, we see a lot of sort of bill ideas and a lot of pieces of legislation that come by us. Uh, and one of the things I think we, I see a lot is sort of the, the lack of understanding sometimes of existing programs uh, sometimes can solve a lot of the problems some people are trying to identify, um, uh, which is part of the solution. And learning that EPA state revolving loan fund money could be used to fund a recreational area slash water control structure in a relatively marginalized part of Wilmington and other places was sort of mind blowing. Uh, uh, and, and that was, so that's, that's sort of the best example of how, or like, uh, you know, HUD, CB, HUD CDBG money being used uh, by Delaware Center for Horticulture to do job training and tree planting in parts of the city that don't have enough trees and need job training. And so those are sort of, I use those as two examples of uh, where I'm sort of one of one of our strengths is uh, finding programs that work, in addition to sort of new programs or new ideas, finding programs that work, uh, and in sort of increasing X. Uh, you know, if CDBG is good and helps uh, DCH fund programs uh, um, and help green parts of the Wilmington, uh, you know, making sure CDBG doesn't get eliminated. Uh, in addition to other urban forestry programs um, and the uh, another another program, I guess another initiative that we were sort of really impressed by that we actually didn't need to do anything on was uh, was there are two basically two women uh, in Delaware a few years ago who sort of stumbled into a regulatory uh, hole and realized you can actually still paint water towers with lead paint uh, and one water tower next to her house uh, was being repainted and sandblasted. She happened to be a nurse and on the, I think the board of the PTA at the time. Uh, and, uh, you know, as much as, as much pushback as we see on some environmental issues at our level, uh, getting their lead paint ban passed the Delaware General Assembly unanimously. Uh, I think pointing out that lead doesn't have a constituency uh, and um, lead paint isn't really, no one really likes lead paint. Uh, and I think I only bring that up as, as a good example of, uh, of, uh, how, you know, when you've got the comfort level, I mean, I think one of them had a PhD, but if we've got the comfort level and the power and the knowledge and uh, the comfortability calling us up or calling other people up and asking about things, it's, it's great, but there are also, you know, hundreds of other community issues that don't get brought up like that. And so I think us being more conscious about how we listen uh, to, to community needs or stakeholder needs, uh, but also sort of asking questions. And then when EPA grants come through, NOAA grants or USGS grants come through, uh, one of the, the best parts of my job is getting to ask, you know, what else can this do? Or, wow, you just, you know, uh, West End Neighborhood House just got a $200,000 grant to do, uh, uh, to help do job training for brownfield remediation. Uh, I never would have known about it unless Marion Young put it on our radar. Um, $200,000 to a nonprofit in Delaware is, it's not even a rounding error on the federal budget, um, but uh, helping to advocate for programs like that that continue to do work um, is something that 
we find useful and has an impact um, and are always looking for other examples of um, things that are working or uh, programs that need sort of a refresher on their capacity. Um, and then I guess the other, the other reason I bring that up is most of the NOAA staff or EPA staff or USGS staff, especially career non-political staff, uh, you know, I, I think we, we sort of generally assume they're all relatively well-intentioned and have spent 15 years at EPA or NOAA because they are dedicated and motivated. And so if we don't have the answers, um, uh, we, we tend to find that agency staff uh, are at least sympathetic and empathetic towards it. Um, and I think the reorientation to being more, more intentional is great. Um, but I think we also are sort of at least you know, think that the, the ingredients, the raw ingredients are there um, to at least address it or sort of think about an issue and not get brushed off. And so I think that that's one of the great things that we're reminded of frequently is that you know, by and large, uh, even though they have bureauc bureaucratic issues they run into, um, usually most of the time when we ask or want to you know, sort of dissect an issue, um, they're you know, nine out of 10 times, if not more sympathetic and interested in, in working with us and trying to find it a solution. Uh, sometimes you know, this week, I sort of think getting close to resolving something, but you know, it was put on our radar four years ago, uh, and it's taken four years of sort of chewing away at it and chewing away at it and tweaking, tweaking things. But um, sometimes it's sort of slower than others. Um, but um, and then I guess lastly, I'd say on brownfields, uh, brownfields is, is is an area where my, my challenge is my boss knows more about brownfields, CAFOs, uh, and sewer lift stations than I do from uh, Chris's time as county executive. And so, um, when it, especially when it comes to brownfields, uh, it's, we'll be driving around um, on our way to or from someplace. And Chris will point out a former brownfield that's now a manufacturing site or a former brownfield that's now been turned into something else and how we use brownfield money uh, and, and sewer money to, to fix an issue or solve, solve a community problem. Um, uh, or sort of where there was a, a, near, a, a near win, uh, but sort of need to still grind away at it. So, um, when it comes to brownfields and funding for brownfields, uh, I, I, I have a I have a great job because I get to work for someone who loves the program already and likes uh, likes making sure that the support for their support for brownfields is there. So, thanks. Great, thank you so much, Andrew. Thanks again for joining us. So next in this session, we're going to be hearing from Bob Benson and Chris Orvin from the EPA headquarters team. So Bob and Chris, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks, Emily. Uh, you can hear me okay, right? Yep, sound good. Okay, so I'm Bob Benson. I'm the acting chief of the partnership programs branch uh, within EPA's Office of Water at headquarters. And I'm joined by Chris Orvin, who is the lead for our national urban waters team at EPA. Uh, we are located at headquarters and we manage these three voluntary programs, these three water partnership programs, all of which have a presence in the Delaware River watershed. Um, and I, I give a tip of the hat and a bow to our friends at NOAA. We work very closely with them, with our Trash Free Waters program and their marine litter program, uh, very much uh, um, cognizant of the environmental justice issues of trash in water. And I would also say, very interesting to hear your remarks, Andrew. I hope you can stay and listen to this presentation uh, because I'd love to have you and Senator Coons learn more about all of these programs and how they are relevant both in, um, in Delaware and across the country for the things that the Senator really cares about. So today I'm gonna to kick it off uh, with a, a national perspective. I'm not gonna talk so much about what these programs are doing in the Delaware watershed, but I wanna we wanna share some perspectives about these programs at the national level. And at the national level, um, the things that we do are very relevant to what goes on in the Delaware River watershed. So these are EPA's three national water partnership programs. Our stakeholders run the gamut of all public and private constituencies. Uh, we work with government at all levels, we work with academia, 
NGOs, we work with individual communities and citizens, we, we work with the business sector. Water partnerships complement traditional environmental programs, the traditional regulatory programs, by addressing challenging non-point source issues in many different ways that traditional programs, traditional water regulatory programs, cannot address all by themselves. And we do this by playing a, a wide range of different types of roles. Uh, these water partnerships uh, facilitate information sharing. And this webinar <laughs> is a perfect example of that in action. Uh, we facilitate dialogue among stakeholders and bring people together to hear voices that don't often get heard and uh, facilitate discussion and try to reach consensus on approaches that work. We facilitate strategic planning, integrated strategic planning. I know that communities often face the challenge of seeing a gazillion different federal and state agencies and trying to make sense of that and feeling somewhat overwhelmed at that. So these partnership programs are ready made to help bring people together and help increase understanding of how all the different parts work and how they can work together to benefit communities and address their issues. We, we then, with these programs, help bring projects to the table and help connect uh, constituencies with funding sources that exist out there. Again, the funding uh, landscape can be very bewildering to communities. And through our programs, we help make connections, inform them, help, at, help them sometimes actually write their grant proposals so that, that they have a better chance of accessing money that already is available to them. So one way to think about water partnerships is that we, we facilitate workable connections to help communities, help others make things happen. And often to do that, we have to address systemic barriers that stand in the way of that. And that's the real value add. That's why these programs exist. We don't write the regulations necessary, necessarily, but we help uh, to help constituencies navigate the system to get things to happen. So that's, that's what we do. Uh, and I wanna turn for just a second and talk for a minute about, about this new administration, the Biden-Harris administration's focus, their environmental focus which is on primarily on two major issues, climate change and environmental justice. And I'm gonna talk about environmental justice. So um, the president issued an executive order, 13985, and it is specifically focused on having the federal family, the federal government put much more concerted attention on environmental justice issues. And one thing that leaps out in that executive order that's particularly relevant to a partnerships approach is the language that I'm gonna read here. It engage with members of communities that have been historically underrepresented in the federal government and underserved by or subject to discrimination in federal policies and programs. And then evaluate opportunities to increase coordination, communication and engagement with community-based organizations and civil rights organizations. So that's our charge. And I can say that our new administrator at EPA, Michael Regan, takes that very seriously. It is his top priority. And that trickles down. So in the water office, our new political head, Radhika Fox, that is her top priority. So EPA is charged with assessing how our programs interact with communities in ways that we might be addressing environmental justice well or not so well and to plan to figure out how we address where we should fall short, and then to figure out how do we implement projects and programs and get investment to happen to address environmental justice opportunities. So our NEP and our, our National Estuary Program and our Trash Rewarders Program are addressing EJ issues, but I think today Chris and I are gonna focus on how the Urban Waters Program is doing that. Emily read the mission for urban waters, and I want to just repeat it because it's relevant here. Urban waters is designed to help urban and metropolitan areas, particularly those that are underserved or economically distressed, connect with their waterways and work to improve them by putting communities first. 
So we have 20 locations around the country that Chris is going to talk about, but I think Urban Waters also does a lot of things that help many communities all around the nation, not just the 20 that are uh, official Urban Waters communities. So for this new administration focus on EJ, Urban Waters, we feel, can be a cross-federal model, a model for how to effectively assess disproportionate and inequ inequitable impacts in communities, to develop innovative strategies to address those impacts, and to facilitate the implementation and replication of those approaches all across the country. And remember, it's not just doling out money. It's helping the communities themselves figure out how to access these funds and how to um, allocate them for projects that will have the biggest bang for the buck. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris to tell you about our urban waters agenda this year. And if we could have the next slide, please. Well, thanks, Bob. Um, and I, I, I will go through this uh, uh, fairly quickly. Um, as Bob mentioned, I'm Chris Orban. I'm the team lead for the EPA headquarters urban waters team. Um, so just to, uh, to quickly review here uh, some of the background on the urban waters drill partnership and EPA's role in that. And, and then at the end, I will touch on kind of the nexus with environmental justice uh, I just want to make sure everybody kind of has the background before we dive into uh, a little bit more of the focus on the topic of this webinar, which is on environmental justice. So as Bob and, and um, others have mentioned, uh, we're, we are working in 20 watershed uh, locations across the country. Uh, really, this is a place-based voluntary program working to uh, connect communities to their water resources, build uh, water equity, um, we have a number of, of tools that help us do that, including the Urban Waters Learning Network, which I'll talk about in just a few moments. Um, and then some you know, information and, and funding uh, resources that we can help uh, connect communities to, uh, to support those, those needs and those priorities. And you'll see the, the logos there of the other federal agencies that are engaged in the Urban Waters Federal Partnership. Uh, next slide, please. So just to give everybody a bit of a national context, uh, there are 20 uh, locations all across the country. Uh, you'll see them here on the map. Uh, we were very excited to add our 20th location uh, just last fall uh, in uh, the Rio Reimagined project in uh, Phoenix, uh, Arizona. Uh, so just a reminder that you're part of a larger national network and, and national program. Uh, next slide, please. So the federal partnership really is kind of the, the core of the, the program. Uh, as Simeon kind of mentioned in the beginning, the, the idea was to get the other, to get federal agencies working closer together and coordinating their resources uh, and decision-making uh, in a more coordinated fashion in particular locations across the country, uh, first as a pilot. And now we've kind of expanded uh, to, uh, to up to 15 different agencies now. It was smaller in the beginning and 28 national uh, uh, nonprofit organizations, non-governmental organizations uh, working exactly to advance this mission of um, working uh, with uh, under-resourced communities to help uh, uh, both connect them better to their, their water resources um, and improve those water re resources. So at the heart of the mission really is uh, both the environmental aspect of it and the social and community aspect of it. Um, that those two things can kind of create a, a virtuous cycle, if you will, of uh, uh, water improvement, restoration improvement, uh, and then community engagement, which leads to more uh, restoration, uh, et cetera. So uh, next slide. Uh, the Urban Waters Learning Network is one of the ways that we do that. As, as Bob mentioned, a lot of what we uh, help facilitate is communication exchange, uh, building capacity, uh, sharing resources, and the Urban Waters Learning Network is a great resource that we are uh, happy uh, to support. Uh, it's a collaboration between EPA, River Network, and Groundwork USA. Uh, we have over 580 members now that are that are on that that resource. A lot of it is about communications, networking, training, uh, helping uh, locations share you know best best practices and, and stories and success stories. Uh, to, to build the capacity, not just of the 20 locations where we work, 
but communities all across the country um, that may have uh, been involved with urban waters in a, a slightly more tangential um, uh, aspect of the past, but we want to keep them as part of this larger uh, national effort. Uh, next slide, please. So the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation's uh, Five Star and Urban Waters Restoration Grants, these are uh, grants that the uh, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation manages, uh, NIFWF, uh, we call them, and uh, uh, we've been uh, very happy over the last couple of years to uh, provide some funding support from EPA, uh, USDA Forest Service uh, also contributes, and uh, the Department of Interior's Fish and Wildlife Service uh, contribute to this uh, really innovative uh, uh, leveraging uh, resource, um, which is able to combine federal funding and uh, private funding, uh, you know, for example, Southern Company, FedEx, uh, BNSF Railway have been able to contribute in the past to develop these small, but I think impactful uh, community-based uh, restoration projects. Um, every project has that combination, as I was talking about in the beginning, of some kind of restoration component and some sort of community engagement or education component. Um, and so we've been uh, very happy to, to be able to support these projects. They're fairly small, uh, but I think they are high, high impact and a good value uh, for us. So many of you may have, may have heard of this, uh, this opportunity, but I thought I would just mention it. Uh, next slide, please. So really, this is kind of the meat of the discussion here today for, from, I think, our perspective on at EPA Urban Waters uh, and kind of how we, we see our, our ability to kind of advance these issues on environmental justice. I think our role kind of helping to coordinate and lead the, the Urban Waters Federal Partnership, the 15 agencies, um, helps uh, support communities across the country that are that uh, are, are 20 locations like, like Delaware River and others, um, address these environmental justice challenges, helping connect communities to uh, federal uh, resources and agencies that they may have trouble connecting to. Uh, and that includes funding uh, for folks that are on the ground, uh, folks like Emily, uh, our ambassadors, who are, are working really in a critical coordinating role um, on the ground to develop work plans, bring the partners to, to a big table, and figure out how to leverage our resources to get a lot of really good work accomplished that will help address some of these environmental justice challenges. Um, so I think when uh, when Jeffrey at the beginning was going over the, the definition of environmental justice, it felt very daunting. Uh, that this is a, a, a historic and, and very challenging um, uh, issue that we've been trying to deal with for a long time. So I think we're we're trying to to help advance that as much as we can. Um, we, we serve and 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 are um, able to provide some, some trainings and some dialogues uh, through the learning network, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, at River Rally, we've been able to, which is their big, uh, the River Network's big national conference, we've been able to provide some trainings. Uh, the Urban Waters Learning Network has been developing tools and resources on anti-displacement uh, as communities grow and change, um, uh, which has been a, a, an effort uh, a, for them and, and a way to share information across the network. Um, and then sort of two kind of headquarters type projects that we're working on uh, in our team are on this uh, flood resiliency. Uh, uh, Janine Finley, who's on our team, uh, is, is, has the lead on this, but uh, really looking across our locations and seeing what are the best practices um, to, uh, to mitigate uh, urban flooding uh, and how have our uh, locations um, uh, plugged into that effort. Uh, we know that urban flooding often hits uh, disproportionately uh, those most uh, under-resourced, underserved communities, uh, and kind of raising up that dialogue and trying to share best practices across the network. Uh, also working with our Office of uh, Research and Development on some social science uh, research to kind of help, um, help uh, strengthen that effort. Our utility uh, project is, is really working to help um, promote water equity uh, across our, our locations. Uh, we've been working with uh, a number of different partners, the U.S. Water Alliance, River Network, Water Now Alliance, uh, Groundwork USA, to kind of uh, assess how uh, communities, uh, how our partnerships are, are interacting with their, their water utilities and how we can work better uh, uh, together with them to, um, to help advance those efforts. A lot of our locations are doing really innovative stuff on, on water equity. 
uh, you know, Camden is a fantastic example um, of that and, and uh, sharing those best practices across our, our network. Um, and then the national, Fish, the NIFWF uh, grants that I talked about before, I think are another way that we're able to provide a little bit of on the ground funding uh, for, for uh, specific projects. Um, it varies by year, but uh, uh, over the last several years, at least 50 to 60% of those projects um, go to uh, either low income or communities of color. Uh, last year it was about 65%. So that's definitely a way that we uh, are supporting these, these efforts. Um, so that's that's the uh, the conclusion of my remarks. Thanks so much uh, for having us, um, and look forward to the further discussion and questions. So back to you, Emily. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Bob and Chris, for giving us some of those updates on the EPA EJ perspective. Um, so we are really looking forward to our last presentation in this session today on New Jersey's environmental justice legislation, and I believe I'm going to turn it over back to Frank McLaughlin for some introductions for Olivia. Thanks, Emily. And uh, thanks to our other panelists uh, for uh, providing your expertise um, and insights into uh, our urban water challenges um, in the Delaware River. Um, I, I'm really honored. Uh, it's a great privilege to introduce uh, our next speaker, Olivia Glenn, the Deputy Commissioner of Environmental Justice and Equity for the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. Olivia has um, experience not only uh, working for state government, but also in the nonprofit sector and the educational sector. And uh, I had the um, great fortune to meet her uh, in about 2006 on a project in Camden, a, a former 86 acre city dump, uh, Harrison Avenue Landfill, which is now uh, a nationally recognized uh, project that not only reconnects uh, this beautiful Kramer Hill neighborhood in Camden, which has over two miles of riverfront and was never connected to the gorgeous Delaware River. And um, Olivia was uh, um, a mentor to me in helping me navigate um, urban issues uh, with that project. And uh, I've been very blessed to, to learn many things from her. And um, I'm so excited uh, now to work for her. So um, uh, Olivia brings personal experience and professional experience to the cause of environmental justice, social justice, economic justice. Um, so we're in a great position in New Jersey to be a leader in environmental justice. And we're so happy to hear all the great things that are happening at the federal level to combat environmental justice and climate justice. So um, um, without further um, admiration, I'm gonna hand it over to my, uh, my friend and my, uh, one, of, one of my bosses, uh, Olivia Glenn, the Deputy Commissioner uh, at the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. Frank, I thank you so much for that beautiful and heartfelt introduction. Um, it has truly been an honor and pleasure for me uh, to work with you over the course of all of these years. And I'm uh, delighted to have the opportunity today uh, to share in some of the work, the great work that we continue to do together and the best is yet to come. So thank you so much. Thank you. And I want to extend a thank you uh, to our Urban Watershed Federal Partners for inviting me today uh, to speak about the environmental justice work uh, that we are doing uh, in the state of New Jersey. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of background on myself uh, before getting into some of the, spe the specifics of our work, um, I just wanted to share that I've spent a great deal of my professional life working to ensure that every New Jerseyan has the right to experience the joy and access the benefits of nature and a healthy environment. My interest in the environment and environmental justice was sparked by the opportunity to experience the great outdoors during my college years. It was vastly different from growing up in Camden where access to safe open green spaces was limited and access to the Delaware River and its tributaries was even scarcer. 
the dichotomy between where I grew up and where I went to college in Hanover, New Hampshire couldn't be starker. My threshold into the world of environmental management was from observing those dichotomies between the idyllic view sheds and aesthetic waters of New Hampshire and Vermont in comparison to the open space desert and urbanized waterfront of my native Camden. My approach to natural resources management has always been shaped by these experiences. My approach is one of intersectionality and connectedness between the natural and social sciences. I first came to DEP in 1998 as an unpaid intern for the Office of Environmental Justice. And I returned after graduate school uh, during the Campbell administration and when uh, James McGreevy was governor. And I have been at DEP as either a full-time employee or as a member of the Environmental Justice Advisory Council since. I returned to lead the DEP's Division of Parks and Forestry in 2008, a job which I loved deeply, facilitating access for all New Jerseyans to our 450,000 acres of parks, forests, historic sites, recreation areas, and marinas. But the urgency of what we must accomplish in this time through environmental justice and equity resonated for me as the highest imperative so I stepped into the new role that I have now. Now as Deputy Commissioner for Environmental Justice and Equity at DEP, I am honored to be leading the department's effort to aid overburdened communities throughout the state and to bolster diversity, equity, and inclusion within our department and other state agencies. And to be clear, for me, environmental justice isn't simply eliminating or mitigating environmental and public health stressors. It is also improving and providing access to environmental and public health benefits, such as providing underserved communities like Camden, Philadelphia, Chester, and Wilmington access to clean waterways. So since the civil rights movement of the 1960s, grassroots communities nationwide have documented disproportionate environmental burdens endured by poor communities and communities of color. They have also asserted their desire to receive equal protection under the law when it comes to their environment. These disparities were not only raised in urban centers, but also in rural communities. And New Jersey is no exception. From our industrialized urban centers to rural migrant farming communities, these concerns are all throughout the Garden State. For decades, Nationwide, stories from communities and academic research institutions have documented these disparities. Specifically, these communities and their studies have shown a disproportionate quantity of minority and poor communities host potentially toxic facilities, such as landfills, incinerators, and wastewater treatment facilities. And it's not just disproportionate exposure. It is also not balanced with the level of consumption by these impacted communities. A 2019 study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences found a racial gap between who causes air pollution and who breathes it. Specifically, that study found that African-Americans and Hispanics experienced 56% and 63% respectively more air pollution than they produced through consumption. This is in comparison to whites who experience 17% less air pollution than they produce through consumption. These disparities are not limited to air quality and facility siting. These disparities are also present in water, water infrastructure, flooding, and reflected in land use and planning policies. And I would be remiss not to note, as we already heard from other speakers, the nexus between environmental justice and climate change. Data over decades has made clear that poor communities and communities of color will be more negatively impacted by climate change through impacts like flooding and sea level rise. On the ground in communities across our state and nation, one experiences a confluence of social issues which have documented connection to manifested past practices that were clearly embedded in racial injustice, such as redlining in housing and zoning and the siting of highways and the consequential bifurcation of communities in the 1950s and 1960s. These environmental conditions and limited mobility contribute to disparate negative public health outcomes, 
such as elevated blood lead levels, asthma, cancer, cardiovascular disease, and developmental problems in overburdened communities. Environmental injustices didn't happen overnight through the course of one decision or one administration at any level of government. It has been decades in the making, transcending not only regulated media, but also urban and rural zip codes across our nation. Impacted communities have been raising concerns on the local level, as well as have convened nationally. At the first and second National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summits in 1991 and 2002, respectively, over 2,000 attendees convened to define and adopt the principles of environmental justice at the first summit and to identify and adopt principles of working together at the second summit. These two summits laid the groundwork for what followed as governmental response on both the federal and state levels. Impacted communities knew all along that they needed to set the agenda, make the issues clear, and engage other entities like government to ensure that environmental justice is realized. Now in 1991, I was in middle school, but in 2002, I was at the second summit as a graduate student, one that was humbled and honored to volunteer as the note taker and editor, one of the few people there with a laptop for the principles of working together for communities, government, and other collaborators. I sat in the same seat for days, listening to First Nations or Native American storytellers, urbanized centers, migrant farm workers, and translators share their stories. It shaped me as a person and as a professional. And there are lessons of listening in many facets I learned there that we bring to our stakeholdering efforts in New Jersey. And as Jeffrey noted in his opening remarks today, communities must be empowered to speak for themselves. Beyond me, there were other New Jerseyans present there those days, including New Jersey environmental justice advocate, Kim Gaddy, who is not only the vice chair of our department's environmental justice advisory council, she is a local community leader and activist for environmental justice issues in Newark. She was an integral part of the bill drafting for New Jersey's landmark environmental justice legislation. The solutions aren't one dimensional or one permit, and the approaches it will take to remedy this undoubtedly require targeted, intentional, inward and individual efforts within departments and agencies, as well as outward and concerted efforts between departments and agencies at all levels of government with the communities we serve. They will take coordinated efforts of government at all levels to reduce stressors and increase benefits in impacted communities. Like the federal government, New Jersey and other states have taken steps over the decades outside of legislation. In New Jersey, we launched our governmental EJ efforts back in 1998 with an environmental equity task force. And subsequently in 2004, Governor Murphy issued our state's first environmental justice executive order. Governor Corzine later did the same. And under the Chris Christie administration, Commissioner Martin established an environmental justice administrative order. Governor Murphy in his first 100 days in office passed an environmental justice executive order whose implications I will discuss in a little bit. While these efforts have been admirable, no environmental justice community in the nation had statewide legislation that could preclude, mitigate, or remedy some of these environmental justice challenges. But in September 2020, New Jersey reshaped the course of history for the better. New Jersey became the first and only state in the nation to take a critical first step via legislation to advance environmental justice. The law is the nation's strongest measure to protect overburdened communities from pollutants. So the environmental justice law specifically within it asserts that the legislature believes that all New Jersey residents have a right to live, work and recreate in a clean and healthy environment. They recognize that historically, New Jersey's low income communities and communities of color have been subject to a disproportionately high number of environmental and public health stressors 
including pollution from numerous industrial, commercial, and governmental facilities located in those communities. And as a result, residents in these communities have suffered from increased adverse health effects. The law also states that no community should bear a disproportionate share of the adverse environmental and public health consequences that accompany the state's economic growth. That the state's overburdened communities must have a meaningful opportunity to participate in any decision to allow in such communities certain types of facilities, which by the nature of their activity, have the potential to increase environmental and public health stressors. And that it is in the public interest for this state to limit the future placement and expansion of such facilities in overburdened communities. So with that, this new environmental justice law requires DEP to evaluate the environmental and public health impacts of certain facilities on overburdened communities when reviewing certain permit applications, such as resource recovery facilities, incinerators, and sewage treatment plants. This law goes into effect immediately upon the adoption of rules and regulations. And at that time, the department shall not consider complete for review any application for a permit for a new facility or for the expansion of an existing facility or any application for the renewal of an existing facility's major source permit. If that facility is located or proposed to be located in whole or in part in an overburdened community unless that permit applicant first prepares an environmental justice impact statement that assesses the potential environmental and public health stressors associated with that facility's application. And it also considers the stressors that are already borne by that community as a result of conditions in that community. And this must be provided 60 days prior to a public hearing. Then the applicant must organize and conduct, conduct a public hearing in the overburdened community. At that public hearing, the permit applicant shall provide clear and full information about the proposed new or expanded facility or existing major source as applicable and the potential stressors associated with that facility. After that hearing, DEP shall consider the testimony presented and any written comments received and evaluate the issuance of or conditions to the permit as necessary in order to avoid or reduce the adverse stressors on the community. For a new facility, the department may deny a permit if it is determined to cause or contribute to adverse cumulative environmental or public health stressors in the overburdened community that are higher than those borne by other communities. So in a nutshell, that in itself is the substance of the environmental justice law. Right now, we are engaged in the rulemaking process. And within this rulemaking process, it isn't simply about the rule itself, but the process by which we will draft it. And as such, since October, we've been hosting topical meetings on our rulemaking, ranging from geographic points of comparison to permit and facility definitions. You can access recordings of these past meetings, as well as PowerPoint presentations on our Office of Environmental Justice website at nj.gov slash DEP slash EJ. In addition to the environmental justice law, Governor Murphy also uh, issued Executive Order 23 to advance environmental justice in New Jersey. And as a part of that Executive Order 23, the governor directed DEP to develop a guidance document and that guidance document is entitled, Furthering the Promise, Advancing Environmental Justice Across State Government. The guidance document was directed within the executive order, and that was for us to give all departments and agencies, boards, councils, authorities, and commissions directions into how they can incorporate environmental justice into their decision-making. Following publication of the final guidance, all executive branch departments and agencies shall consider the issue of environmental justice and make evaluations and assessments in accordance with that guidance. Now that we have a guidance document, we have also formed an interagency council where all of the executive branch convenes to take a multidimensional approach to some of our state's greatest environmental challenges. 
And as I stated earlier, furthering environmental justice will require targeted intentional inward and individual efforts within departments and agencies, as well as those outward and concerted efforts between departments and agencies at all levels of government with the communities we serve. And taking that inward look, as well as coordinating that outward coordination across the whole of government is the intent of the executive order. We also know that the environmental justice law is not, encompass is not all encompassing as it only addresses certain types of permit issues. But we know that with the executive order, we can take a much more holistic approach to, address to addressing a myriad of environmental justice concerns. So with that, I want to stop and just give recognition uh, to uh, yesterday. I was able to tune in to the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council meeting. And Administrator Regan gave great remarks, indicating strong, clear resonance between environmental justice, climate change, and the whole of government approach, including listening, coordinating, and engaging with communities. So we here in New Jersey see this as our shared charge, and we look forward to continuing to work with the members of the Urban Waters Federal Partnership and all of the members of the Biden-Harris administration. So thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you today. Wow, great. Thank you very much, Olivia. What a what a great presentation to really kind of close out our environmental justice session today, you know, by talking about the many pollution disparities, you know, you know, this New Jersey EJ legislation and you know, getting us energized and getting, you know, this important this this important type of work done. And you know, so thank you, you know, everyone. Um, those were very fantastic presentations today. And we do have quite a bit of time for a QA session. And we did, we have received quite a number of questions just regarding, you know, receiving copies of slides and all this great information that's been shared today. So again, this webinar is being recorded um, and we will post this recording on PDE's YouTube page. So you will be able to get all this great information. And it looks like some of our panelists are even sharing some of the links and information in the chat with everybody right now too. So moving into our Q&A session and uh, panelists, if you wanna you know, join us again, feel free to turn your, turn your cameras and mics back on. All right. We're gonna open up the, see some of the questions that we've been receiving. So the first one that we have um, was, you know, our volunteer internship opportunities for local college students. So you know, any feedback from you know, our panelists on you know, maybe how, on youth opportunities for this type of work. Emily, I can I, I could talk about not for college graduates, but both Philadelphia and Camden are involved in the Power Corps program. And in Camden, we are training 30 residents, 18 to 26, in the water fields. They are doing everything from uh, helping us with illegal dumping activities to cleaning up rain gardens and replanting rain gardens, refreshing rain gardens. And some of our graduates are now working for the Camden County Municipal Utilities Authority, American Water, who is headquarters in Camden, and also Cooper's Ferry Partnerships. So um, that is a program for non-college to, to build non to, to build leaders in the community who know the community best and are trusted within the community. And they're learning, obviously, the importance of the environment in their community, but also becoming our future leaders in those communities and getting jobs for some of our anchor institutions in the city of Camden. And Philadelphia, I know, has a bigger and even more uh, a broader program, uh, a power core program, too. So um, I just wanted to mention that is one of our ways we are. Um, um, bringing in uh, young talent to better represent the communities that we, we're trying to serve. I'd want to work for Olivia Glenn if I was a summer intern. Yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> <laughs>
So I can um, also just share um, that the New Jersey State Park Service does a lot of hiring of summer seasonals. We, are hired, we hire like between 700 and 900 seasonals each year uh, to work in our state parks, forests and historic sites. Um, so if you give me a few moments, I will find the precise URL and I will drop it into the chat, uh, but we are actively doing that hiring right now. Um, the other opportunity that we have within our department is that we do have a watershed ambassadors program and uh, we, can, we can provide some specifics on that as well. So I'll put those two things in the chat. Fantastic. Emily, this is Simeon too. I, I, I would say that NOAA has various um, internship uh, programs, fellowships, uh, different levels. So, um, you know, they, they come up in, at different times. Uh, but if, if there's any specific uh, internship you know, someone might be interest, interested in an internship with Noah, for example, you know, please, uh, let's talk about it. We don't have internships as a community organization. I mean, I work at the university from that perspective, there are internships to work with groups. And we've done this um, learning process where at the university, students have worked with community groups um, on their issues. And so there are opportunities there. And I work with a group that does training of organizers so that might be another opportunity to connect with uh, opportunities to work in issues related to environmental justice, et cetera, at the community level. Yeah, this is Scott. I just wanted to add to what, what Simeon mentioned. I put over in the chat a couple of the student opportunity links related to, to NOAA. One covers all of the different programs we have. Um, another one gets more specific to some of the educational partnerships we have with minority serving institutions as well, and certainly encourage exploration of those um, and connection to, to Simeon if they're ones that relate more specifically to some of the worlds of work that we have in the Office of Response and Restoration. Fundamentally agree with the point as we look at diversity and inclusion within the agency, as well as our provision of equity and our delivery of services, it's really important to, to look like the country that, that we are um, and both fronts to be able to best best serve the communities that we serve. So anyway, some links that, that may be useful for you. Again, focusing on, on the broader NOAA, NOAA portfolio. And there are a lot of programs in addition to the ones that I talked about before that really are out there doing great things in the environment, in our stewardship mission and so on. Thanks. All right, so uh, another question that came in specifically more towards our Delaware folks that are on, you know, what advice do you have for reaching, you know, and providing outreach for EPA's uh, Brownfields programs, maybe to the to the smaller communities that are, you know, in Kent and Sussex County? Uh, I guess, I, I don't know enough about the, the questions trying to learn to, answer and are they wondering how to get brownfield money for a project or um, I yeah know. i could maybe answer that um with my experience in new jersey dep we have a very close working relationship with epa region two and epa region three uh i've worked in the brownfields program prior to my role in the community collaborative initiative and uh epa's monies grant monies for environmental assessments of brownfields and environmental cleanups of brownfields, and they also have a loan program, have been instrumental in getting our sites um, understood from an environmental liability standpoint and also uh, for cleanup monies. And um, just one site in Camden, the Harrison Avenue landfill site, had received $1.6 million in grants from EPA over many years, including a $200,000 brownfield assessment grant, which helped us and the Salvation Army under, and the community understand the environmental challenges at the site so we could move forward with additional gathering of resources and have a directed focused approach. So um, Region 3 is, a, is terrific. Brownfield's program is terrific. So is Regions 2. And uh, if, 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 any Brownfields folks or EPA folks are not on the call, I would be happy to take um, an email or questions to help a community get 
work with EPA to get a to get a brownfield assessment grant or cleanup grant or whatever the community needs. Yeah, Frank, I was going to uh, echo something similar. Um, you know, EPA brownfield contacts are very heavily involved in our urban water federal partnership. So, yeah, we can. That's part of the role of the partnership is to. Um, you know, identify the agency contact, put persons in, in touch, but uh, we can definitely help make that connection to the Region 3 folks, and they, they've been great uh, for our Urban Water Federal Partnership. Great. Yeah, and Brittany actually just who asked that question chimed in again, you know, she's looking for, you know, contacts, community groups, you know, a way in to be able to increase the number of applicants from Delaware. So Christina Gaffney, and I, you know, I can provide her email address. It leads the, the, the Brownfields and Land Revitalization Program at EPA Region 3. So Christine Gaffney would be um, the contact I would start with. She leads the program. And um, yeah, and, and, and every year there's EPA does training sessions in communities about how to get grants and uh, they're open to everybody. So um, Normally they have them in the summer because normally they, they their application season is in the in the fall. So um, we'll make sure that our website has uh, information regarding contacts with EPA Region Three and Region Two, um, so communities can understand what resources are available to help them with their brownfield sites. Hey Emily, can you hear me? Yes. So, so Frank and Simeon are super fast on the draw. So when the EPA related question came in, I'm fun, fumbling with how to turn on my camera and they've already given a better answer than I could have given. So all I'm gonna to add to what they said as the EPA guy is if you want to help uh, have us help you make connections with any program, we're, we are here to help as well. The links to some of our programs are in the, um, in, in the chat box there and um, happy to assist with making connections. Part of what partnership programs do is serve as master connectors to bring people together with experts to help you. So uh, don't hesitate to reach out to your friendly EPA folks as well. That, that sounds excellent because we, we work with a lot of community organizations and we're part of some coalitions and some of the coalition partners working across the state on various issues, policy development, et cetera. So, I'm sure a lot of them will be very interested in how to access additional resources at the community level. That would be tremendous. Could, could I just back up and just re, uh, make one more point real quick? Um, one of the points that we tried to get across in our presentation was EJ is a big federal priority right now. And, and there will be money going out for more money going out for projects. And agencies like EPA and NOAA and other federal agencies are trying to figure out how to very quickly uh, prioritize where the money needs to go. So I think this is gonna be an opportunity and I think information that we gather on, on uh, you know, big picture projects um, through our partnership programs, talking with your partnership programs like Urban Waters and NEP, NOAA programs, state programs are a great way to kind of get yourself in the running for money that is surely going to be spent on brownfield redevelopment, smart brownfield redevelopment that it takes into account EJ considerations and other programs, state revolving fund, other programs um, to address inequities. So now's the opportunity and now's the time. Uh, no question there is a big federal focus on environmental justice and spending money in the right places to fix the problem. Great, thank you. Um, another question that came in, an interesting one, you know, how do you change the attitudes um, from some people of, um, in communities that do not think twice about throwing their trash on the ground? You know, I've been in Trenton and I've seen individuals throw trash on the ground right next to the trash can. How do you change that type of culture? Well, I would, I would say you have to connect children teachers, parents, residents to the environment. Uh, we've been very intentional in Camden through, we have, a, we, have a, we have a tree planting program. We have a, we started the Camden Smart Initiative in 2011, which, which is a nationally recognized community-based green infrastructure success. We have the Camden Collaborative Initiative that we started in 2013. By the way, EPA was uh, 
uh, one of our great partners in the Camden Collaborative Initiative, and, and they continue to be so. Um, but we feel at New Jersey DEP, you have to embed yourself in these communities. And we talked about regulatory frameworks, but we also have to work in a partnership framework as our friends in the Urban Water, Waters Federal Partnership at EPA and this webinar is about, we have to, agencies have to engage in these communities in all ways, not just as a regulator, but as a partner. And in Camden, we've gone to schools. In Camden, we have brought children out onto the water, the Delaware River, who never even knew the beautiful river was just a few blocks away from their home. So we have to be better leaders in connecting people to the environment. Now that our power core and other residents are involved as volunteers in cleaning rain gardens, they understand that the trash ends up in rain gardens or, or ends up in sewers, which cause flooding. So um, it takes a concerted intentional effort and we need the nonprofit community, the academic community and all levels of the government to help educate because they've traditionally been disconnected from the environment as Olivia so beautifully stated the difference between growing up in Camden and seeing um, northern New Hampshire and Vermont as a difference. Um, and that's the reality. Olivia's reality is the reality of today's, many of today's uh, residents in our cities. Could I, could I just offer another comment there too? Uh, I just put a link to Trash Free Waters in the box there, which has some what you can do resources. But in our working on this issue and working with our friends in NOAA and at the state level on this issue, you have to kind of, we, we consider trash as a, a really quintessential environmental justice issue. So many inequities in terms of the impacts of trash in water affecting the, the health of citizens uh, it's related to trash and it's low hanging fruit in terms of fixing them. But to the question, what we've what we found is that you have to kind of hit people where, where you live. If Bob Benson from EPA goes out and says, hey, please don't put your trash on the ground, put it in a trash can, that's not gonna resonate them. So part of the trick is to figure out working with communities, figure out what messages are gonna resonate from their perspective. Is it appealing to the family? Is it appealing to religion? Is it appealing to other things that local communities, and it always with EJ comes back to, you've got to listen to what people say, listen very carefully and react to that. Have it be a bottom up thing, as opposed to government saying, hey, be smart and do it this way. Hey, Emily, this is Simeon. Uh, just to add something to that uh, as well. I really learned um, in Los Angeles at the National Brownfields, uh, conference listening to the Los Angeles thing really hit it home like um, and and it was mentioned here today empowerment is is so important so um, I think it was mentioned like a trail was built or different things were built if it was built by local community people there's ownership there's empowerment they protect it more versus some company coming in from out of state and constructing it and 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 leaving and then as a scientist or as a more natural scientist i'm really starting to appreciate these connections um so i think and we and i mentioned we have a a, a a webinar may be coming on housing. I think housing is an important component of that. You know, home ownership. Uh, nobody literal, really, rarely litters out in front of a house that they own, you know, as an example. They're, they're, again, that's more empowerment and, and ownership. So there, there are connections outside of the environmental world, you know, economic, environmental, and, and environmental justice stuff. You know, things like community cleanups are very important. Um, you know, sometimes the the federal government may, may not look at those type of things as fund worthy because they're going to have to do it multiple times is, is their mind. You know, they're looking really to change the, the system rather than clean up the event. But, you know, I think as neighborhoods get and areas get cleaned up, you know, uh, and beautified, if that's the right word, people, you know, there'll be just different attitudes about uh, you, you know, contributing, you know, so if you can change it from a negative to a positive, that, that that's a big thing. I, I would agree. I think that um, in my own life growing up, my mother was heavily involved in the communities, uh, community action networks, um, 
had Saturday cleanups. I live in, in Pittsburgh, PA, a black community called Homer Brushton. And she did that for years. They had um, Operation Better Block. It was actually an organization in the community, a uh, long-term, long-standing organization um, where Saturday cleanups, they had food, people would come out. And this is right in the heart of, of the community, black community, no, no question, in the city. So we did these. And so that makes a difference because you have multiple generations understand this is important. And wherever I've done, I used to be, I've worked in community organizing for a number of years, as well as being a labor organizer as well. So we've always found that when there's always someone in every community, no matter how challenged that community is, that cares about the community. At least I've found that every community I've been in and any city I've worked in. And so connecting with the people who are respected, who are known, who are the people that say, Ms. Jones, well, you need to talk to Ms. Jones about that. You know, there's people like that in every community. And that person knows the networks, whether it's the church or other civic organizations, and they can be the one to talk to people. And yes, even some of the people on the corners doing stuff that's not cool, even some of them might say, that's Ms. Jones. Or, so there's ways to pull people in to get things like that to happen. I think that's really from the ground up and connecting, working with people where they are and then kind of building out. So. I just wanted to add one thing to what everyone else said, which I agree with everything that's been said before me. Um, but I just also want to add a dimension um, of illegal dumping that happens in many of our urban communities. Um, and one of the underlying issues with illegal dumping is that when people illegally dump, there isn't always the follow up with compliance and enforcement. And so I think, you know, we talked about a lot of things here that are carrot and I like carrots, um, but just to add another dimension to this um, with the sick to just have some, uh, you know, greater coordination um, between people who do and entities, companies who do that illegal dumping in uh, urbanized communities. But I will also note, if you look in some of our state forests, you'll see that dumping happening there as well. So I don't want it to be painted that this is just like a lens of something that happens in urban places because it's not it's just more concentrated people there. Um, but just wanted to add that uh, compliance and enforcement and illegal dumping piece to the conversation as well, not just individuals. And the people in the community want that as well, because I've been in communities, people, they keep dumping stuff down there. I mean, so people in the community would, would support that, or at least that core group that can be the yeah, basis for taking action. So can't agree with that more. Yeah. Great. Thanks, everyone. So we are getting pretty close to that two o'clock mark. We do have, still have a couple questions that came in, but just to be conscious of everyone's time, you know, thanks. Thanks everyone for sticking with us for our two hour webinar today. Um, I do wanna give another big thank you just to all of our speakers, um, really great presentations and updates on very important topics from everyone. Let me just- hey, Emily, uh, this yes. is something real quick. So yeah. the questions we didn't get to, we, we can capture them and, and circle back. Yes, perhaps. we can definitely do yeah. that. Yes, yeah, so we'll have everything kind of saved um, in the chat and we can absolutely follow up um, and answer those questions um, and get those responses in. Uh, we'll get a follow-up email to all the participants for, for all the attendees that tuned in today. We can we can definitely do that. So yeah. we do have- um, two Olivia, I mean, I mean, Emily, I would like to say one other thing, uh, it, uh, just in terms of the Urban Water Federal Partnership continuity. Uh, and just, there's a lot of partners uh, on this call that have been you know, with us through the years. And I just want to, again, compliment, and we'll be hearing more from our partners in the future webinars and their projects, but uh, the, just the work that they've done, to, the willingness to pursue, uh, uh, you know, to persevere. Like when the Urban Water Federal Partnership started out, you know, there was a lot of momentum, you know, momentum's change, uh, you know, politics change. These people on the ground persevered and kept going and they have all my admiration. And so I'm not trying to knock uh, the higher ups. I, you know, someone like Olivia is very inspirational working her way all the way to the top. But I do want to emphasize that this isn't a top down program and that we at the ground should not be waiting for anything top down. That the people here in this uh, partnership have been you know, work in the streets, if you will, or work in the river, and and they will continue to do that. And um, 
you know, this this isn't a passing political fad to people that have the passion for it. And and I and and I think we have to give, you know, the politicians, people have been let down. The government's let people down a lot. But, you know, you always have to give somebody another chance So would take them for the word. But I just wanted to re really emphasize that this isn't a and uh, with the urban water federal partnership, as much as we admire and appreciate the support from the higher ups. This is not as much a, a, a higher up driven program as it is a bottom up driven program starting at the community. And my hat's off to everybody that's been uh, supporting their communities and working with, in this partnership. And we have a lot of good uh, stories to tell and you'll be hearing about them in, in uh, future uh, webinars. Yes, great. Thanks, Simeon. So yes, we do have two more um, webinars coming up as part of this virtual Brownfields and Environmental Justice Communities of Practice series. We're going to drop that registration link in the chat one more time. And so the next webinar in this series will be next week on Thursday, April 1st, again at noon, covering um, urban waters, city brownfield updates. And then the Third webinar will be the following Thursday, uh, April 8th at noon again, and we're going to have some presentations on several environmental justice community initiatives that are taking place. And then, as Simeon said, you know, we're working on that fourth webinar that's going to focus more on affordable housing and infrastructure. So kind of stay tuned for, for that fourth webinar, and we'll get those details out once we um, get a date and time finalized. Um, and again, you know, please provide any feedback on our draft urban waters location work plan. You know, we're accepting feedback until April 9th um, and we value the input of, you know, all of our partners and folks that live across um, this urban waters location. And thanks again for everyone for attending today's webinar. We really do hope to see you again next Thursday and the following Thursday. So thank you and have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you.